Indigenous peoples from around the world met at Whitley College to discuss Christian faith after colonialism, or in academic terms, post-colonialism. But we were talking about it as two-way theology. I'm Mark Edica Paulson and I was a facilitator at this conference, but I also had the privilege of interviewing people to discuss their ideas about theology and its engagement with communities and its engagement with institutions. The people that you're going to hear from are leading thinkers, pioneers in their fields, from Maori theology to post-colonial studies, but also Native American, Osage Indian theology, and theologians from here in Australia, both academics and non-academics, but people who have a desire to see how their faith engages with the community and the reality of complex communities and also how their faith engages using their knowledge systems and how it transforms institutions in which they partner with. I went home the, that weekend and um, we were back in the marae and as you probably know at the, in the marae at some point there's a storytelling time. I was invited by the old people to tell my story, so I stood up and told my story about how my children were doing, how I was doing, and then I thought, well, I'll end this with a funny story. So I announced in the marae that, and guess what, the bishops asked me to go and teach at St John's College, and I started to laugh, thinking everybody's going to think this is hilarious. And nobody laughed. And then um, my aunties got up, and I, I can still remember them weeping as they said, thanks be to God at long last, one of us. And it was then that I, I, it just came into my mind what my grandfather had done. And then I realized that this was a call, not, a, not, a, <laughs> not an option. And um, so that's what took me to St. John's. It wasn't, a, it wasn't um, as if I applied for the position or, and I went there full of trepidation and full of misgivings about my ability to do anything. And, um, it's been a huge challenge, a huge struggle, and yet it's been the most profoundly satisfying career I think I could ever, ever have been blessed to have. So that's where I've been, and I've tried ever since I've been there to create the space that I think my people have yearned for, to be within that institution and yet be free to flourish as Māori you know, not as um, as honorary uh, white folks. They just want to be, to bring into the institution um, the gifts, the particular gifts that, that God has entrusted to our care, our language, our perceptions of, of um, what is theologically defensible, what are the things that are life-giving and life-sustaining that God wants for each and every one of us. So I've tried the best. Um, that I can to ensure that that is happening. Anti-colonial is oppositional and post-colonial is far more complex and nuanced. Post-colonial refers to uh, the uh, engagement of the formerly colonised with, uh, with colonial power and colonial discourse. And that engagement takes many, many different forms. Um, and what's happened in post-colonial theory is a recognition that the old binaries, what we call the Manichaean binaries of uh, bad colonizer, good colonized, uh, have been very much dissolved and there's a, a much more interesting process of transformation. Rather than simple anti-colonial opposition, what's much more interesting is that uh, colonized people have taken all forms of uh, discourse, language, technology, that were used to suppress them and transform them to become empowering. And this is something that colonizers never could have uh, expected. And it's the most interesting aspect of post-colonial studies. Two-way theology is about collaboration. 
but it's also about the recognition and acknowledgement of two paths, two stories, two histories, and two knowledge systems. So how can we genuinely make two-way theology? How can we do this authentically? Well, one of the ways we need to start is to affirm the agency of Indigenous knowledge systems. Not only for Indigenous peoples to see their own knowledge and to have that recognised and authenticated, but also the important critique that Indigenous knowledge systems has to transforming institutions and other ways of thinking. First of all, and, and what I said yesterday when I spoke, is that that's a European word. It, it, there's no equivalent in any Indian language, or as far as I know, any indigenous language. It's a word that was created in Europe, really, in the Middle Ages. Uh, it came out of Latin, from the word supranus, meaning principal or chief, and it eventually became, in Middle French, uh, reshaped into souveranus and then souverain and sovereign in English, and hence it means the principal person or the chief. Or, or, or the principal idea, you can talk about a principal idea, but, but the principal person was the king. So you began talking about the divine right of the sovereign, the divine right of kings. So immediately you have, once again, that up-down image schema. The sovereign is up here, and everyone down below is under the aegis, controlled by, subordinate to that sovereignty of the sovereign. Now, when I suggested that belongs to the white world, the Christian world, because Christians can then can talk about the sovereignty of God, in fact, the king becomes God's appointed vice regent in charge of this kingdom, uh, in our world, there is no sovereign. There is no chief person. Yeah, we have two Gallega who share a certain kind of authority, but, but as soon as our borders are threatened by another nation, these two Gallega lose any authority they had. And authority is turned over to a council of 70 or 80 elders who then have the authority to talk about whether to go out and defend the border and how. And then there's another 12-day ceremony in which different people take leadership from different clans at different times and you know, the, the bear clan has to bring out the, the bundle to even begin to talk about going out to do battle. Uh, and so they pull a pipe out of this bundle. They can't even load the pipe until an elder from the deer clan brings a deer skin pouch with tobacco in it and puts the pouch down by the, the pipe so that the pipe can be loaded. If he doesn't bring it, we can't continue the ceremony. So that's very powerful, right? But then his power, his task is completed, and it moves to another clan. And over the next uh, four days, <coughs> during the public parts of the ceremony, different people take a certain kind of leadership at different times. Uh, so there's no sovereign, no superannus. There's only the balance and harmony of the whole. And, and even when the military contingent leaves the village, the, 
there are four uh, leaders from each division. So there are eight leaders of this detachment. Kretzake, they're called. And two of them, one from each division, are called the head Kletzake. Again, you've got two people giving orders. Which one is the sovereign? Which one is the superannus? Well, they better agree, or this isn't going to go well. <laughs>
of each other. Rule and subdue, serve and protect. And in effect, there's a, there's a balancing of the two narratives there. Human beings do have special responsibilities. Uh, is it a matter of just, just subduing? No, it's a matter of also serving and protecting. Uh, we have to recover that sense of, on the one hand, very special human responsibilities. We are capable of destruction that animals are not capable of. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, the, um, the sense that we are um, creatures dependent on and caring for other parts of the created order. Uh, and interestingly, when you, when you read on the different land, land theologies in the Hebrew Bible, there's an emphasis in priestly theology that land is given by God to particular clans, particular places, we could call it country. Mm. Uh, and in a strong sense, Leviticus 25 says this, and you find it in Genesis as well, you, strictly speaking, you don't own the land. Um, Yahweh, God owns the land, uh, and you are resident aliens. You are strangers in that land in some sense. Now, that's very strong language to, in order to emphasize that you don't own land as property, mm. properly God owns the underlying land mm. and the generations uh, who are given that particular clan land uh, preserve it for the next generations. Mm. Uh, Another strong Aboriginal myth is that uh, we don't own the land, the land's owned us. I remember as a 15-year-old teenager sitting in the Aboriginal Inland Mission Church at Fingal, hearing my grandmother say from the pulpit, God is my father, the earth is my mother. I nearly fell off the chair, thinking, Nan, they're going to kick us out of church. <laughs> Until I read the passage in, 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 in the Genesis 1, I think it is, which says, and God came to the earth and said, let the earth bring forth. Indeed. So God gave a creative power exactly. to the earth. There are, there are two verses in Genesis 1 that are often overlooked. We, we see all the verses that says God, God said, mm. God spoke, all those divine words, but two of those words are, let the earth bring forth. And actually the Hebrew verb there plays on childbirth. So, so actually the Hebrew gives license to the idea that the mother, earth, is called on twice in Genesis 1. Firstly, um, to produce uh, vegetation, Mm -hmm. and in the second verse, to, to produce creatures. So the earth, if you like, is giving birth mm -hmm. to vegetation and creatures, participating in the creative activity of God. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in Genesis 1. And it's interesting that God took substances from the earth to create and fashion human beings. That's right. We are earth creatures. Yes. All of us. All of us. Seems like the white church and the... Black Church need each other. When we look closely at two-way theology, we see that these paths have complexity. They have diversity. They have many voices, both within traditions and across traditions. Two-way theology is a genuine, authentic conversation that engages with this complexity holistically. But for this to have a future, we need to embed this in our institutions.